Well, one of the things that I've been interested in, and I follow you on the strata, I know you spend a lot of time uh, in the saddle uh, on your bike, and I'm really curious <laughs> about how you, um, how the text and interacting with the text with the maps that you're using and mapping these places around your town, uh, how that being on the bike changes your perception of those things, how mapping your town changed your perception of it, your relationship to it. It's different when you're passing through town in a car, when you're walking on your feet, or when you're on those two wheels. So is there any dimension to that cyborg consciousness about how you're, you're getting around town on two wheels or, or in a car? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, at each speed at which you operate, you're in a different town. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think it would be hard to say that speed has a lot to do with the notion of space. And so my relationship with a space around town is going to change with the speed at which I'm operating, you know. It's part of the phenomenal encounter of what makes a space a space. Totally, yeah. You know, I, I think... I'll get back to the issue of, of like, you know, the biking thing, because I'd just i love to go back there. But initially, I want to say, what I think really fascinated me about doing um, the around town alphabet stuff was how it actually helped me change my notion of the alphabet. You know, one of the um, texts that was an inspiration for that piece was a series of pictures of... Um, objects and settings in one or more urban environments in which you can kind of see the outlines of each of the alphabetic characters. So for example, one of those, um, I don't know what they would be called, but like those saw horses that are used to put like a big caution sign up, you know, they're used to those triangular saw horses. Well, that side view, that looks like an A. And, um, you know, a cul-de-sac can look a bit like a C or an O. And you can easily trace out an H from, you know, a downtown street grid or other letters like that. Um, I just started to kind of see the alphabet in town. And then I started to see town in the alphabet, which means all of a sudden the alphabet became um, alienated to some degree from its logocentric relations, kind of naturalized relation to speech. And that, among other influences, was an opportunity to start thinking beyond, um, to start thinking about writing as, as a gesture or as a visual kind of expression, you know. But I think what I find really interesting about the biking thing that you brought up <coughs> are the metrics, you know, like all, like I just I'm, posted something about this on Facebook a couple of weeks ago because I just bought another sensor for my bike, you know, and most of the guys that I'm riding with, you know, they take it pretty seriously. Some of them are racers and they're recording, you know, six or seven dimensions of data on their rides. They're doing um, speed, you know, miles per hour. They're doing cadence, which means, you know, RPM of the pedals, you know, going around. They're doing temperature, you know, just ambient temperature, because obviously that's going to say a lot about why you did well or didn't, among other things. They're doing heart rate. They're doing watts, if you've got the money for a power meter. You know, like how, how hard are you pushing on the pedals or how much power are you actually putting into the bike, you know? So all that stuff will then show up on a two-dimensional graph within some saved program, you know? And then, of course, there's a GPS. So, I mean, getting, you know, getting back to your question, I'm really fascinated with the opportunities to kind of use data like that, you know? I mean, if we look at writing as, as a line that can be deployed in all different kinds of ways, and if we look at that line as connected to different kinds of surfaces, it's interesting to think about how I can use a sensor in some context to create new kinds of compositions, which, you know, in an indirect way is part of what I was trying to do, not with sensors, obviously, but, but in that piece. Um, but, you know, kind of going off, I guess, digressing for a second to make a statement related to that, I think it's really important for us as compositionists to just move away from the alphabet. You know, I, I think that the importance of the alphabet related to literacy 
and to um, so literacy is incredibly powerful and we, we can't let go of that obviously you know for reasons related to politics the disciplinary identity I mean um, culture society I mean that alphabet you can't just you know I, I would think it would be irresponsible to say forget the alphabet let's just move on but I also think that when you look at where communication is going or has gone in contemporary society, which has largely moved beyond the alphabet to other forms of expression that, because they're numerically based, can just be almost anything. If we can get back to a notion of writing that I think is not just alphabetic, can be most anything, then we have a chance to really explore the ways in which technology is on something like a bike, or for that matter, um, you know, in a programming language can can represent new forms of, of research in the field and connect us, I think, to other fields in STEM or in the humanities that have also made that turn because they could, because they weren't so wed to text the way we are. Well, and you started this by saying it was a digression, but I don't, I don't hear this as a digression at all. Because one of the things that I see you doing is talking about found art and data interpretation and data manipulation and how that leads to further writing. So that we're writing about writing and we're writing about the censors and then seeing relationships that are only possible because the censors are showing us things mm -hmm. that we wouldn't have access to other ones. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the hopes of big data that uh, by collecting all this we'll start to see relationships and correlations that we wouldn't have otherwise and that's you know you talked about the chain mail images and some of the other images that you produced that were surprises and like you said it's just a start and that's where we start to begin to see those relationships where we reveal those relationships between data that's nascent that we don't have access to but that by displaying it and by playing with those algorithmic relationships to bring something out, we can start to, to visually to see relationships that otherwise aren't available to us. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I really like that. And one more thing about the biking thing. So um, <laughs> you know, when, you, you know, when you save your data from the rides, like among other things, it'll give you like a GPS drawing with the map overlay of like where you went. And a buddy of mine um, did a ride um, on a mountain bike on, you know, just some little off-road trails. And the drawing that his ride created was beautiful, you know. Unlike riding on the roads, you know, where things are, the lines are kind of long and relatively straight. You don't have these sharp turns, at least not on a road bike. His drawing was just so intricate, you know, it was all these little switchbacks and turns, you know, I can just imagine him like having to stop and do 180 around a tree and then go back and, you know, it made me think we should be, you know, I should create like, you know, a little company or something or just, just do blowout posters and put some of the data at the bottom to like commemorate really interesting rides, but the drawings are so beautiful. Anyway, the point is to say, I could see where if I were to say that's writing, that's a composition, Someone in art would say, well, yeah, sure, you know, but where our field is, I don't think we're ready to all say, oh, yeah, totally, that also is writing. And that, I think, needs, I would like to see more of an acceptance of writing off the page at different surfaces, deploying different kinds of lines, post-alphabetically, um, as part of where we're going. I just don't see a lot of it, or enough of it. So, um, is this what you're working on now? On what? No, on those uh, posters? No, no, but I'm... Um, uh -huh. What are you working on now? Is it related to what you've just said? Yeah, actually it is. Um, so I presented, a little, I presented a piece of what I'm finishing up right now um, in Indiana, at the Indiana Digital Rhetoric Symposium. So right now I'm just kind of a month and a half away or so um, from finishing up final, final revisions for a book um, titled Suasive Iterations, which is all about rhetoric writing and physical computing. 
And as I said in Indiana, as I explained in the book, like physical computing is this kind of post PC era of computing. An opportunity for us as rentors and writers to really kind of engage with a new form of innovation computationally, where you're not working within a computational medium that that you know kind of separates the virtual from the real, so to speak. You know, if you think about the PC era, meaning a personal computing era, in which we're operating right now, in which most of us do a lot of our work as scholars. You've got a screen through which you engage with the virtual realm of the computer, and you've got a minimal set of sensors um, with which you do that, the keyboard, the mouse, and maybe in this case the webcam, all three are sensors. But in, in an era of physical computing, you know, space now is becoming increasingly everted as it's been characterized or hybridized, um, where because of the ways in which sensors can take in data and because of the ways in which we can feed back interesting mashups and creative applications of that data back into the real world, you're operating in a more kind of, you're operating within a virtual real space where it's, it's just not possible to draw that line. Um, so the book is really about how we can play with that era, you know, how we can work within that, that that new that new era of innovation, um, creatively, suasively, and so yeah. Each chapter, each of the main chapters, I've got um, computational projects that I've developed, and several of them have got lines streaming across the screen, visualizing the potentials of what you can do with the data. So yeah, lines all over the place. <laughs> and this, of course, is what I like to call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's funny because when I drafted the book, I didn't. I just hadn't downloaded your argument um, fully, and now it's part of what I'm going to be doing the next month is just getting your book all over my book. And it's just so obvious. In fact, I kind of see some real compliments between what I'm trying to do computationally and a lot of what you're arguing in your book. Yeah, but you're able to uh, pursue the argument in terms of some of the more concrete aspects that. I simply wasn't able to touch on. And I think it's really exciting what you're doing. I also really agree with your point that the virtual and the actual is a distinction that no longer has critical capacity. Totally. Usefulness. We have so much feedback in the materialization of information that transforms who we are and what we do that in some ways to hold to that distinction actually uh, falsifies our uh, phenomenological, phenomenological encounter with the, with the structured world. Totally. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, even with the data that I'm even reading in real time on the bike, you know, I mean, there's, I'm not, you know, what kind of a space am I in when I'm in pace line going at whatever speed with a bunch of people you know, as I'm looking at my data, thinking about the data, thinking about where I am in relation to the data, I mean, even, even you know, in shorts and a jersey on a bike, you know, in, in some rural setting in North Carolina, it's a virtual space, you know? Well, and then one of the ironies, though, is that when we tried to get out into the world with our new mobile devices to try and erase those distinctions, we had to retreat to our offices because we have better bandwidth, more connectivity. Yeah, yeah. Seeing the post-PC era, we're seeing what's next. But then our limitations still are dragging us back. So so our Wi-Fi and whatever the, the, the latest uh, speed on our phones is, isn't quite enough. But we're seeing what is possible. What I think is so interesting is the relationship between the thin computing, you know, these little devices with very little power, and how they're connected to these big computing engines behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so we're back to that big iron, thin terminal uh, driving us. And huh. it's allowing us to, to create these new relationships with our physical spaces. I, yeah, I love that that idea. You know, you talk about in your jersey, in your padded shorts, on the bike, out among the fields, but yet your mind.
mind is at least in part going through and parsing the data, looking forward to the data that's going to be delivered, and yeah. thinking about what is this ride going to look like. No, without a doubt. I mean, you know, the smell of the farm, you're out there with the wind and the trees, it seems so natural. It seems so outside and beyond technology. Right. And yet, because of all the data and the data-centric ways in which I relate to the bike, to the ride, during, post, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a hybrid, everted sport. But then I was so frustrated all winter doing those half-hour, 40-minute rides on the stationary bike and so <laughs> I, uh, just so delighted for my first ride, even though it was a little early and there was still snow everywhere, but to smell the smells and to feel the wind, I mean, it's still it's an important part of cutting through real space. Yeah, and getting back to Thomas, I mean, that's the ambience, man. You just, you need, you need all those extra dimensions of ambience to make it feel, quote-unquote, real, you know? Uh, and, quote-unquote, it's not the real. It's the no, real. Yeah. Does it mean something different? Yeah, no, we're through the looking, we're through the looking glass. Even if, even when you're totally disconnected, you're bringing the virtual with you. I mean, how can't you, you know? Right. 